Manila, capital city of the Philippines, where one out of every seven Filipinos lives. Manila is a city of high-rise hotels, gleaming office towers, the base in the Pacific for multinational corporations. It is home port for this island nation on the South China Sea. This is another side of Manila. It's called Smoky Mountain, the largest dump in the city of eight million where trash is always on fire. But this is much more than a dump. It is home to thousands of Filipinos who have no other place to call home. It was hard for me to comprehend the poverty of a place like Smoky Mountain. To see the children, their stomachs bloated from malnutrition, the children with no clothes that play amidst the garbage, the flies, the open sewers. It's a very poor area, probably the worst that I've ever seen. And uh, the people here, they uh, pick through the garbage to get whatever they can recycle to sell, to get enough money to, to eat. As the bulldozers level the next wave of garbage from Manila, the people of Smoky Mountain get to work, the only work most people have. And the children, the little kids, walking through the heat and smoke, clawing for a piece of metal or a string of old wire. This boy helps his brother so he won't burn his feet on the burning garbage. During the rainy season especially, there's uh, a lot of disease amongst the children especially. What kind of things do they suffer from? Uh, cholera, typhoid, tuberculosis. Several years ago, the government bulldozed this slum and moved the people out. But they came back. They couldn't find other places to live. This 18-year-old girl cuts up rice sacks for 50 cents a day to feed her two children. Why does she live here? She says, I am here because I lost my house. My parents-in-law had to leave. We couldn't afford the rent anymore. This man has lived at Smokey for the last eight years, even though he has a job as a security guard. And you have to live here? Yeah. You don't have enough money to live anywhere else? Yeah. On the day we visited this place, thousands of Pro Marco supporters were marching to a rally in central Manila. The people of Smoky Mountain looked on, watching the campaign, but thinking of the terrible poverty that is their lives. Many people, both in the Philippines and here in the United States, blame the poverty on President Marcos, his wife Imelda, and their cronies. They are accused of stealing billions of dollars from the people. Congressman Stephen Solars of New York. I personally have absolutely no doubt whatsoever that the President and First Lady of the Philippines have invested hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in real estate in New York City uh, and to some extent elsewhere throughout the country. Congressman Solars has begun to document his charge that the Marcoses and their business partners have taken some $10 billion out of the country to build their real estate empire of office towers in Manhattan and estates in the countryside. Back in the islands, the First Lady, Emelda Marco, spends millions more building shrines to house the country's culture and art. Across the street, families live on the islands between the roadways. They see the Marcos and Aquino campaigns whizzing by, and they wonder. February 7th, Election Day. For millions of Filipinos who live in this kind of poverty, it is just another day. If Marcos wins, if Aquino wins, their lives will change very little, unless the next government undertakes drastic economic reforms and tackles the severe issues of human neglect. Supporters of President Marcos, convinced he'll be re-elected, say he will bring change. When a person is at the last end of a long term, he cast his uh, sight already in history and the impelling motivation to do good for the country. And so I perceive that the next six years will be characterized by uh, uh, exciting development and changes. But the Aquino campaign, sure of enormous grassroots support and victory in a fair vote, feel President Marcos will take the election through fraud. 
And if that happens, former advisor to the Philippine government, Russell Moran, feels this will be the result. If he steals the election, to put it very baldly, then uh, I think you can expect in the United States there's going to be very, very severe demands for curtailment of military aid to the Philippines. If that happens, he has no choice, I suppose. He wants to stay in power, but to further repress the people. But this time, he'll be repressing them with their own money, right off their backs. It was a time when darkness descended over mankind as a shadow blocks the light of the sun. Adolf Hitler's Nazis passed a death sentence on the Jews in the quest for a perfect Aryan race. The Germans set up an elite force, the SS, their mission, Judenrein, to make Europe free of Jews. The SS, brutal in their methods, rounded up the Jews, sent them to ghettos, humiliated, starved, tortured them, and murdered them if they protested. The terrorized Jews were promised food for work if they went to labor camps. When they arrived, most were sent to gas chambers, the remains of their bodies used to enrich the German nation. By the time the horror ended, six million Jews from a dozen nations had perished in the final solution. A minority of the German people actually participated in the slaughter of the Jews of Europe. A majority acquiesced. They turned the other way. They didn't want to know. But there were a few courageous Germans who risked their lives in the name of humanity and justice. One of those people was Hermann Graby of San Francisco. There are different ways to kill people. There are different ways. Hermann Graby is 86 years old, weakened by 18 heart attacks. 45 years ago, he was an engineer building railroad lines for the German war effort against the Russians. While working in the Ukraine, Graby discovered the other German war, the war against the Jews. They had to go down the pit. The pit was designed so the people had to lay this way, not straight, this way. And uh, on the side of the pit were steps so they could go down. And uh, it was one man, he had a machine gun here, and he was a, a good shooter. This is how they were exterminating the Jews in the East. Hundreds of thousands of men, women, and children all sent to a horrible death. And they shoot at killing naked people, even out of the hospital. Eh? And so I said, Something should be done. Something should be done. So that was the beginning. Reverend Doug Hunnicky of Tiburon spent years researching and writing a book about Gravy's efforts to save the Jews. He used all of his engineering skills to create, to build a rescue network that, that was almost unprecedented in the war. He kept moving Jewish people east, bringing them onto his labor crews and then getting them out of the reach of the mobile killing units and the Gestapo and the militia. Maria Barroyo, a Polish refugee, was one of those saved by Mr. Gravy. We talked to her via our New Star satellite in Miami, Florida. Maria, when you think of what Mr. Gravy did in the Ukraine during the war, what comes to mind? Whatever he was doing was strictly illegal extremely dangerous, and by that I mean he could lose his life, his family life, and he had a wife and a son, because he had to fake the whole thing, and against him was a very, very mighty country with uh, intelligence, police, all apparatus. Graby had only his spirit and courage as weapons. He used his position building railroads for the Reich to scare off the SS. He had a trick. He would look straight in the eyes of an SS commander and he would say, my orders come from the highest offices in Berlin. And they'd be scared to death. And then he would say to them, my report to Berlin will show whether you cooperated or hindered my effort. 
In the village of Ravno in the Ukraine, Grebe used that tactic to save 113 Jews from the death pits. He marched them with pistol in hand in front of SS troops. That night, one of the German soldiers who had witnessed this, a command officer, not just a soldier, saw Grebe walk into the tavern, turned to him and derisively pointed and laughed and said, ah, here comes the Moses of Ravno leading his Jews. To Grebe, that was a term of honor to be compared to Moses. No one knows the exact number, but Grebe saved several hundred Jews from death. After the war was over, Grebe was the only German to testify at the Nuremberg War Crime Tribunal. In 1965, Grebe returned to his hometown in Germany. What did the people think of you when you went back to Zoligan? Traitor. Clearly a traitor. If Grebe's own people couldn't find pride in his efforts to save innocent people, the nation of Israel did. He was given the honor of lighting the eternal flame at the Holocaust Memorial at Yad Vashem. He was also honored by the Jewish community of San Francisco and former Mayor George Moscone. To the people Grebe saved, like Maria Babro, who lost her husband, mother, and father in the Holocaust, Grebe is a hero, a man who knew his own life meant nothing unless he did his duty to mankind. It took me a long time to believe that one person can be so heroic, so unaware of being heroic. I feel that there should be some way that he should be put as an example of a tremendous moral courage. The port of San Francisco, one of the most thriving on the West Coast. Ships from all over the globe called here. Today, though, the port captures only a small percentage of ships coming to the West. We explore the reason for that in tonight's cover story. Evan, in part one of our cover story on the port of San Francisco, we look back in time at how the port developed, how it almost died, and where it's going now. At stake, thousands of jobs, millions of dollars, and the character of the city of San Francisco. The wind and fog blow from the Pacific through the Golden Gate Bridge as the British cargo ship, the Duke, ends her 10,000-mile, 17-day voyage from the Orient to San Francisco Bay. The Duke is just one of nearly 3,700 ships that will enter the bay this year. But like the Duke, most will sail by the port of San Francisco and drop anchor at the port of Oakland. It wasn't always this way. San Francisco used to dominate shipping in the West. Shippers from all around the world came here to load and unload cargo. In fact, San Francisco was born because of the maritime industry. The Spaniards were the first to use the port. It was a staging area as the mission spread throughout the state. Then in 1849, the gold rush, thousands of schooners came to San Francisco as hordes of gold diggers headed for the mother load. Really, the port of San Francisco gave birth to the city of San Francisco. People settled on this side of the bay first because there was deep water here. Ships could get close to the shore, and that's why we have a city of San Francisco. And the early days of San Francisco were wild. There was so much corruption and graft at the port, the state of California took over port operations. During the First World War, the port played a critical role in the war effort. And in the 30s, the port was the focal point of a major labor movement that led to bloodshed in the streets. Bloody Thursday was July 5th, 1934. It occurred on Mission and Stewart Street. Uh, people were then picketing on the whole of the waterfront, and the fierce resistance led to a bloody uh, resistance on the part of the, the ship owners who then were working in concert with the city police. The protest ended with two picketers dead, dozens injured, but ultimately the union movement won. During World War II, the port saw a stream of activity as ships were built, men and equipment transported to fight the Japanese. The port was still number one in the West. But in the 1950s, 
Los Angeles became the largest population center in the state and the largest consumer market in the country. Shippers started tying up in LA, dropping San Francisco as a port of call. For the first time in history, the port of San Francisco didn't dominate shipping in the West. The city, alarmed about losing thousands of blue collar jobs, began looking at ways to bring the port back to life. Port director, Gene Gartland. The people of San Francisco were not able to control what was being done on their waterfront. And they were not able to persuade the people in Sacramento, because it was controlled by the state legislature, to invest the capital that was needed to be invest, invested to stay in the, the modern area of shipping. And in 1969, after 100 years of state control of the city's 7.5 miles of waterfront, San Francisco regained the power to make decisions. One of the first turned out to be a critical error the building of bulk cargo operations targeted at heavy cargo like steel, newsprint, and cars. That decision almost killed the port instead of bringing it back to life. The port commission, the harbor commission in those days, uh, guessed wrong on technological developments in the maritime industry. There was a great change from uh, uh, break bulk cargo handled on pallets and that kind of thing to containerized cargo, cargo shipped in metal boxes and loaded on, uh, on ships. Container shipping operations like those being developed in Oakland were the wave of the future. San Francisco had missed the boat. The once bustling waterfront began to deteriorate. Piers fell into disrepair. The Embarcadero became ghost-like as business vanished. San Francisco, once the biggest port in the West by far, had fallen to sixth, with only a minuscule 3% of all West Coast general cargo operations. The city knew it had to rebuild port facilities in order to survive and went to the public in 1984, asking approval of a $42 million bond issue to do that. The people said yes to shipping. New container facilities were built with the money and new rail lines are under construction. Well, I think we're doing very well, and I think the trend that we are seeing uh, in our cargo is uh, certainly up and up as much as any port. Our share of the market is increasing uh, dram dramatically in the last two years. The port has had its successes. 26 shipping lines now regularly call on the port, a gain of eight in the past two years, and a profit of almost $6 million was made last year. But some question whether San Francisco can ever be truly competitive, while others urge a regional approach to shipping on the bay. We'll look at the future of the port in my cover story tomorrow at 6 o'clock. Fascinating stuff. Thank, Thank you. you. The port of San Francisco. This is where 7,000 people earn their living. But port business means millions of dollars for a local economy, and it's been struggling for a long time, hard hit by fierce competition from the other West Coast ports. The plan to resurrect this particular port is Jim's cover story tonight. Evan, uh, the port used to be number one in the West. Today it is sixth, handling only 3% of all West Coast container operations. Now San Francisco is trying to get back into the game in a big way, but there are sharply different views on how the port is doing trying to bring back shipping. I think we're coming back strong. We're certainly uh, further ahead than Tacoma was two years ago, and, uh, and Tacoma is now saying it's going to be bigger than Seattle next year. So I think we're in pretty good shape. The whole Bay Area has been losing out in handling container traffic to Los Angeles and the Pacific Northwest. Both men are right. San Francisco port business is better now than two years ago, but at Oakland's expense. And the entire Bay Area is losing out to competition up and down the coast. In 1979, San Francisco and Oakland controlled 31% of West Coast container shipping. The Northwest, 23%. Southern California, 45%. Today, we've shrunk to 22%, while the Northwest climbed to 27%. Southern California now has more than half of all container shipping. To turn that trend around, our ports will have to overcome some natural advantages in the LA area and the Northwest. Look over the globe and you'll see the first problem. By sea, the Northwest is eight to 10 hours closer to the Asian ports than the Bay Area. For shippers, time is money. 
Even though it's even longer to Los Angeles by sea, that's the largest consumer market in the country. And L.A. has huge numbers of plants that use raw materials shipped from the Orient. Our position doesn't get better for goods that move into the country by rail. Both Los Angeles and the Northwest are closer to markets in the Midwest and South. Our rail traffic to the South routes through Los Angeles. And surprisingly, it's 200 miles farther to Chicago from here than it is from Seattle and Tacoma. San Francisco competes by having a natural deep water harbor, saving tens of millions of dollars on dredging. Oakland has a lot of land and highly developed container facilities. And the Bay Area is now the fourth largest metropolitan area in the country. We have an advantage here. We've got six and a half to seven million people within a 200 mile radius. Gene Gartland is a booster. He wants to push ahead, upgrading facilities to lure new shipping lines. While many across the Bay in San Francisco push for maritime expansion, others believe it would be a costly gamble, resulting in a price war here against the Port of Oakland. That, in turn, could hurt the entire Bay region. A head-on-head -head competition, which means that we would each uh, cut our rates and uh, strive to get the same shipping line to move from one side of the Bay to the other. This regional trade war is not just a Bay Area conflict. Here in the city of Seattle, port officials are trying to gain an even larger share of the shipping business from the Pacific Rim nations, and they are grappling with some of the very same problems as the port of San Francisco. To have two ports like Seattle and Tacoma in the same region of Puget Sound, or two ports like San Francisco and Oakland in the same Bay Area competing for cargo is uh, only inures to the benefit of the steamship company because they can drive rates down. Earlier this year, the port of Seattle was the largest containerized port on the west coast. It has now slipped to fourth after the Sealand Corporation moved its huge operations, taking millions of dollars worth of business, 30 miles south of here to the port of Tacoma. Seattle's port director wants Seattle and Tacoma to do what no two private companies could do, to get together and cooperate to stop trying to cut each other's throats. I think if the ports agree on three basic areas uh, where you face competition among one another, and that is agree on rate structures, agree on your capital investment plan, and agree on joint marketing, form a, a basis of agreement on those three areas, it's going to help the region. California Assembly Speaker Willie Brown thinks we should go one step farther to merge six Bay Region ports into one. I think we need a regional port because it's clear that uh, the competition between all of the ports so closely are located uh, does not uh, do justice to what the share of the market California should have, and particularly Northern California. The Superport plan isn't getting support, least of all, from Oakland. They've got the upper hand right now and don't want to give it up. So San Francisco is pushing forward with expansion plans, even though new container operations are still vastly underused. And opponents just don't buy it. We do not see the need for any more investment in new container facilities unless and until the Port of San Francisco can prove through actual trade volume that it is capturing a substantially increased share of the market. And we don't think they will. And other critics of the port think San Francisco should not push for development now, but to wait for the next great technological revolution like robotics and beat the competition to the punch in the future. But in the meantime, is the port of